and it's my pleasure to co-share it with Professor Ala Shalabi and Professor Yasser Al Said. And uh, the topic of this session will be the intervention of bronchoscopy, bronchoscopy for peripheral lung lesions. And uh, as a guest speaker and one of our major pillars in our activities of bronchology, we have uh, Professor Heim Becker. He's going to give the fluoroscopy. Is, is there is still a role? Thank you, Heim. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, is there still a role for fluoroscopy for peripheral lesions? When we look into the factors that are influencing the results of transbronchial lung biopsy in peripheral lesions, we have the anatomy planning, navigation to get to the lesions, different instruments to take specimens, the preparation of specimens, and skill and environment for the uh, Interventionalist. Anatomy uh, refers to size, localization, whether it's more central or more peripheral, whether there is a bronchus sign leading to the lesion, and whether lesions are malignant or benign. So uh, the results, of course, are very different when the lesion is more than three centimeters uh, than if the lesion is uh, smaller than three centimeters. Also, when there is a bronchus leading into the lesion, it's much easier to get your, with your instruments to the lesion than if you have to perforate the bronchial wall. And uh, especially malignant lesions have a much higher uh, diagnostic uh, results than benign lesions because uh, uh, it is very difficult to uh, diagnose uh, the benign lesions. This is uh, with regard to the bronchus sign. Uh, if the bronchus is leading into the lesion or the, leading, uh, the lesion is infiltrating the bronchus, obviously it's easier to get biopsy specimens than if lymph nodes or a tumor is compressing the bronchus leading to the lesion. For planning, uh, you have to prepare your approach uh, by diagnosing the lobe and the segment of the uh, part of the lung where uh, the lesion is located. You can use fluoroscopy, tomography, uh, conventional tomography, and CT scan. Of course, you should be uh, very um, well trained in uh, localizing all the different segments on the lung on the plane and lateral x-ray. And in former times, uh, when we didn't have CT scan, we had conventional tomography where the X-ray was moving over the body of the patient, and you could focus in different uh, layers of the lung. And this here you see cavitation with the uh, aspergilloma. Of course, today we have the CT scan, but you have to be very knowledgeable to see the different uh, segmental bronchi on the cross sections. So it takes quite some experience to exactly localize in which segment uh, the uh, lesion is localized. And then, of course, we have quite a few tools to navigate uh, towards the lesion. Uh, I will only talk mainly about fluoroscopy, briefly about CT scan. The others will be covered by the other speakers. Um, usually, when you do uh, uh, transponcal lung biopsy under fluoroscopy, uh, you see on the monitor, you see the endoscopic image and you see the fluoroscopic image. You have a CT arm that you can rotate around the patient uh, to have different uh, planes uh, and to navigate your instrument towards the lesion. Um, and as you see here, uh, when uh, you have malignant lesions, uh, you have uh, under fluoroscopy, you can have uh, real good results uh, with the, the instruments you have. And again, in this uh, paper, it showed that the bronchus sign and uh, the size of the lesions are the main factors for positive results. Here you see uh, a lesion uh, with a bronchus leading completely uh, rightly into the lesion. And again, you see uh, that the result with the bronchocyne uh, is uh, better. And also in this uh, uh, paper, 
and you see by, by Metas uh, group, you see that you can use different instruments uh, from washing, curettes, biopsy forceps, brushes, and needles to obtain histology. To improve the localization, there have been studies. This is Fela Koppen uh, doing the study uh, under CT uh, control. You can exactly see that your needle, that your uh, uh, biopsy forceps is inside the lesion, and the yield is much better than under fluoroscopy. However, uh, when uh, you consider that, of course, you have to have time slot in the CT department, so usually we had five or six transparental biopsies. You completely block the CT uh, department. You have to move all your stuff if you don't have it in your endoscopy unit to the CT department, and you have quite uh, a significant radiation exposure to the patient and to the staff, so it is not routine uh, to use that. Then we have a lot of instruments uh, to take uh, tissues. We have a lot of different size instruments to get more to the periphery. And uh, recently we have bronchoscopes where you don't have to bend and uh, um, talk with your uh, wrist to get to the lesion, but you have a device at the tip, so you can rotate the tip of the lesion from the handling of the instrument, which is much easier if you want to get to the apical segments. We have miniature endoscopes that you can use in mother-baby technique. So you go out into the bronchus, you see whether the lesion is endoluminal or compressing, and then you can slip the regular, bron regular bronchoscope over the miniature bronchoscope to get to the lesion and take appropriate uh, uh, samples. Uh, Dr. Shina Gawa, who was once staying in my hospital, he did a prospective study with the Atlas Slim bronchoscopes and uh, had results of uh, over 60 percent, <clears throat> but uh, the uh, uh, biopsy tools are too small in many cases to get significant uh, uh, material. Uh, here you see results uh, from 60 to 80 percent with uh, Atlas Slim uh, endoscopes, especially when you use uh, uh, virtual uh, imaging for the navigation. I think uh, one of the future uh, developments might be uh, the nanotechnology with micro machines that you have at the tip of the ultra thin endoscopes uh, that uh, are driven by electricity to take biopsies uh, or brushes. So this might be an alternative for improvement. Um, what comes out uh, of the whole thing is when you take sputum pre or post intervention, it didn't prove very useful, especially for diagnosing cancers. Maybe infections, especially TB, is good. You can have uh, obtained secretions uh, spontaneously or wash or have BIL. Uh, you can use catheters, brushes, caresses, forceps, and needles to obtain things. So you see the invasiveness, of course, is much less if you take uh, secretions or transport lung biopsy, whether you do uh, surgical biopsies. <clears throat> if you have secretions within the bronchial system, you can collect them. Here you see tuberculosis, acid uh, uh, first uh, uh, bacilli, and here you see the culture uh, of tuberculosis bacteria. Uh, when you come Pair uh, catheter, what we say catheter aspiration, you go to the lesion and take samples uh, with uh, transparental biopsy. You see that uh, the catheter, uh, because uh, you can sample more tissue than when you take the biopsy forceps, is superior in uh, many instances, but especially if you combine catheter, so called catheter biopsy. Well, aspiration with the transbronchial line biopsy, the results are uh, pretty high. Bronchiolar alveolar lavage, 
really has not uh, no uh, place in uh, diagnosing cancer in peripheral tumors. It's very rare that you find tumor cells, but it's good, as we saw in the lectures before, for uh, interstitial lung disease. Here you see asbestos fibers in that. With brushes, when you reach the lesion, you can reach a larger part of the, of the lesion. Here you hardly see uh, the lesion, and with the brush, you find aspergillus uh, in uh, this uh, lesion. It's uh, lung aspergillosis. Transbronchial lung biopsy is the most established one. You move your forceps outside into the periphery of the lung. Here you see uh, the forceps uh, in this subpleural space. I prefer to have uh, large forceps because with the large gastroscopic forceps you don't get so far outside into the lung. The tissue is much bigger than when it's only in the cups and I prefer not to pull the biopsy specimen through the biopsy channel because I lose, as you see here, a lot of material. In addition to prevent pneumothorax, this is very kind of you, Thank you very much. Uh, to prevent pneumothorax, I advance the forceps till I reach the first peripheral resistance. If you open the forceps now, it can pull itself under the pleura, so you go back a little bit with your forceps, open it, and then forcefully push it against the wall. Here you see I push it against the wall. This is uh, the lingula, uh, and then you pull it, and you see how the tissue follows the forceps. And with this technology, uh, you can get very big uh, pieces of forceps. This is a, uh, of tissue. This is a benign lesion, chondrosarcoma, and you see uh, the material you get is very big. So we, in a study that we published for interstitial lung diseases, we could improve our results uh, up to 80% when we used large forceps, a lot of biopsies, uh, and didn't pull it through the biopsy channel. Uh, for that, you have to communicate with your assistant, so uh, especially when you don't clearly see the forceps, you say, open, please, and the assistant has to repeat to say, yes, open, because when he doesn't, he's distracted, doesn't hear to you, listen to you, you think it's open, and you push forward, and you have pneumothorax. So teamwork is very important. So you see the size of tissues up to 400 alveoli. This is uh, granulomas in sarcoidosis between alveoli, and if uh, the, the tissue is floating, you can be sure unless it's fatty tissue, you can be sure that it's lung tissue. If it's uh, going down, it can be lung tissue with severe infiltration, but not necessarily. We had some experience with so-called multibite forceps. These forceps could grab tissue, pull it into the shaft, and grab another tissue. So you could, within one step, you could take five biosafe specimens. Here you see the size of specimens, but uh, the the tip of this uh, forceps was a little bit stiff and caused, because it's more traumatic, caused more bleeding. Uh, one of the recent uh, applications to take good biopsy specimens is cryobiopsy. You have a cryobulb, you go towards the lesion, you sh briefly, within three, four, five seconds, you freeze uh, the probe to the lesion and then you tear out the tissue. Uh, the advantage is the tissue is not crushed, it's very well preserved, so the pathologists like it very much. So in cases when uh, the uh, cancer is, you, you don't have a bronchus sign, in this case you should uh, need the technology that Ko Peng Wang from Baltimore proposed. You take a needle, you go through the bronchial wall, you go through the obstruction or through the carina, and push the needle into the tissue and take out uh, biopsy specimens. They are more automated or conventional needles, doesn't matter which needle you use. So you see a whole list of uh, statistics, but when you combine all uh, technologies, even under conventional fluoroscopy, you can achieve uh, diagnostic results up to uh, more than 70%. Um, 
one of the really proponents still of doing fluoroscopy guided uh, transbronchial uh, uh, biopsy is Stefano Gasparini. And uh, he could show that when you combine all the techniques, you can have over 95% of re results. And then how do you prepare it? Uh, you take the sample, make smears, and uh, what has been shown to be especially successful is rose rapid on-site evaluation when you have the pathologist direct by your side, so he can tell you immediately you hit the lesion, you didn't hit uh, the lesion, so go back to another biopsy specimen. But for many, it's difficult to have the pathologist. So currently, he is starting to train uh, pulmonologists to look at the specimens uh, themselves, they can see this is uh, material, it's not lung tissue, and then the pathologist can do the a special uh, a subclassification of the lesion. So my conclusion is fluoroscopy, is there still a role? Yes, there is. And if all the conditions that I explained are met, and it's optimal, of course, if you have additional uh, techniques available. Of course, when you have uh, ultrasound available, you will not make the most effort to do it under fluoroscopy uh, uh, as if you don't have it. And uh, so uh, the uh, evidence is that it should be performed for lesions at least uh, 8 to 10, 10 centimeters, uh, centi uh, centimeters in diameter. And uh, this is what I like to say is uh, you can leave your car uh, uh, in the car park and wait until you have a Ferrari. But as long as you don't have these, all these advanced technologies, it's still worthwhile to do bronchoscopy under fluoroscopy. And with this, I thank you for your attention. I'd like to thank okay. uh, Professor Baker for this elegant, highly scientific talk. I'm uh, going to thank the Muqtamar, Dr. Tara Safwat, Dr. Ashraf Hatim, على دعوتي في المشاركه في هذا الهايلي ساينتفك هاي ليفل هاي براو تيست كونفرنس احب اشكر زملائي الكو تشيرمان الدكتور ياسر سعيد ودلوقتي اود لايك تو انفايت بروفيسور اشرف مذكور فور هيز توك ريديال اند برونكال الترا ساوند بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم في الاول بحب اشكر استاذ الدكتور اشرف حاتم واخي الدكتور اشرف احمد الحلفاوي على دعوتي للمؤتمر وزمايلي في جمعيه البرونكولوجي واستاذ الدكتور طارق صفوت دكتور علاء شلبي دكتور ياسر اتس ان اونر تو سبيك افتر بروفيسور بيكر اي واز تريند ان السنتر 16 ييرز اجو اون اند برونكال الترا ساوند ذا فيرست وان هو توت مي اند برونكال الترا ساوند واز بروفيسور بيكر ذس واز ان يير 2000 سو اتس ان اونر تو سبيك افتر هيم اون ذا توبيك ذات اي واز تريند ان السنتر I'm going to speak today on radial probe and the bronchial ultrasound for diagnosis of peripheral lung lesions. The lecture outline, I'm going to speak about peripheral lung lesion, the diagnostic challenges, the EBIS, and how to use the radial probe as regarding instrumentation technique and the uh, pictures of the ultrasound images in peripheral lesions and how to use it with fluoroscopic guidance, guided cheeses, and what are the clinical results and how to combine it with other techniques, then I will conclude up. Oh, we are all confronted by such peripheral lesions like uh, we see here in the CT. It may be a tuberculoma, it may be a bronchogenic carcinoma, it may be a hematoma, it may be a carcinoid, even it may be a vascular lesion. Our main concern is the differential diagnosis of this peripheral lesion. If this peripheral lesion will be benign or malignant, this is our main task. We have different modalities to do this. We have diagnostic challenges. We can go from the least invasive to the most invasive. We can start with the sputum cytology, bronchoscopic techniques, or we can advance it with CT-guided transthoracic uh, needle aspiration, VATS, and even thoracoscopy. I'm going to focus on <coughs> the, uh, the radial probe, but the diagnostic bronchoscopy 
which uh, options are the transbronchial, as Professor uh, Becker said, transbronchial fluoroscopic guidance, ultra-thin bronchoscopy, radial probe uh, EBIS, virtual bronchoscopy, electric, uh, electromagnetic navigation or combination. In all diagnostic bronchoscopy, it's important that if this is our essentially blind techniques. The, uh, the, yield, does, the yield is less than ideal. Uh, the localization does not guarantee sampling success. The journey is important as the destination, and there are some instrumental limitations. Professor Becker have covered the transbronchial biopsy fluoroscopic guidance, so I'm going to focus on EBUS. By EBUS, we can reach to tomographic images of the tracheobronchial tree and adjacent structure. We can reach bronchial uh, airway characteristics, vessels, lymph nodes, tumors, and the lung parenchyma. We have two types of EBIS, the radial EBIS and the convex probe. The radial EBIS, uh, which is we use for diagnosing of peripheral lung lesion, this is our radial probes. Uh, we can advance them through the bronchoscope and then we can inflate the balloon. Uh, while in parenchymal lesion, it's not a must uh, to, to inflate the balloon. You can make the ultrasound probe naked without uh, the balloon. This is the system used for EBIS application. And this is the miniature probes, uh, this one with the balloon. And, the, and this is when we inflate the balloon. We do not need to inflate the balloon when we do in peripheral lesions. We do not use them most of the times. This is the technique. We introduce the bronchoscope. Then we introduce the endobronchial ultrasound probe to site of lesion. Then we uh, operate the EBIS machine and see the peripheral lesions. The normal lung appears as a snowstorm. Well, this is due to the reflection in the air present in the alveoli. This is the characteristic normal picture Then we see in normal EBIS. What about in, uh, in tumors? In tumors, we have dark areas like this, and we have a characteristic bright border. As you can see here, this is the normal lung tissue. This is the tumor, and this is the characteristic border. It's uh, this of a, a tumor in the CT, and you can see the normal lung lesion and the tumor, and this is the line of demarcation, so you can easily uh, reach it. What about the inflammatory regions? In the inflammatory regions, there are inhumocenous distribution. You will see uh, some dot white spots. This is indicating of air bronchogram, so you can realize that this is an inflammatory an inflammatory uh, process. Also, you can even, if the lesion has some areas of breaking time like this, which is the tumor with areas of necrotic tissue and continuing fluid, you can see it also as well with the EBIS. With the fluoroscopic guidance, you first introduce the endobronchial ultrasound probe, and then you localize the site of the tumor with the EBIS. Then you, uh, put the, you confirm with the fluoroscope you are in the, the direct position and introduce the forceps under your control with the fluoroscopy. And this is what started Becker to do uh, in the early parts of application of EBIS guided by the fluoroscopic guidance. And this was my experience when I'm doing my doctor degree in Augusta Krakenanstalt in Germany. This this one, one of the cases of my MD thesis. This was a peripheral lesions, and we can, in year 2001, I, this is the tumor, and this is the pulmonary vein, and this is the lung tissue, and this was a case of adenocarcinoma. We did this with fluoroscopic guidance. Uh, Kurimoto put a, a guided cheese, uh, via guided cheese, which extended the working channel. He put a guided cheese, then he introduced the ultrasound probe, identified the tumor, removed the, the ultrasound probe, and then introduced the biopsy forceps. So he's sure 100% he's uh, inside the tumor without the need of fluoroscopic guidance. Oh, there are, are dedicated uh, uh, guided cheeses that can help you, provided by Olympus. And nowadays, there is a double hinged curette in areas where there is too much angu angulations. So you can introduce this, help you to achieve difficult areas to reach with this double hinged curette. This is a, a solitary pulmonary nodule, which is visible by fluoroscopy, as well as by endobronchial ultrasound. And this is the localization with the EBUS. And sometimes you cannot see by the fluoroscopy even the, the solitary pulmonary nodule. You can see it by EBUS only. You can see it here in the CT. So you, uh, EBUS can reach invisible areas with fluoroscopy. This is another example as well. You cannot see it here, and it is very evident. There is a long list of clinical results uh, as regarding the radial probe EBUS. I'm going to pass the first one for sure is the, from Heidelberg, Professor Becker and Hirsch. This is one of the first early publications, 2002. There was significant uh, more yield with uh, EBUS in lesion less than 3 cm, more than fluoroscopy. But in lesion more than 3 cm, there was no significant difference. And what is important is the small lesions that the fluoroscopy cannot reach. 
Another importance, even in year 2015, still in a Spanish group, uh, they did uh, with the fluoroscopy, they reached a diagnostic yield 72%, in lesions less than 2 centimeters, 64%, more than, uh, than 2 centimeters, 80%. They said that they start this without any specific prior training, and they said that their center was of limited resources. So can you even start this process with centers with limited resources without prior training? You can reach a diagnostic yield 72%. This is uh, uh, applied through the uh, Kirimoto, through the guided cheese. He can localize overall diagnostic yield 77%, but he have a better yield when the probe is inside the tumor than the probe is adjacent to the tumor. When the probe is within the tumor, you can reach a diagnostic yield 70, 87%, while when it is adjacent to the tumor, 42%, and they have differential of, uh, of the lesions, even lesions less than cent, uh, one centimeter, he can reach up to diagnostic yield 77%. This is a five-year experience from, uh, from uh, St. Louis, uh, Missouri. They have uh, 467 patients. Their diagnostic 69%. Uh, they reach a uh, good diagnostic yield 84% when the tumor, when the EBIS probe was in, uh, inside the tumor, while 48% when the tumor was adjacent to the lesion. This is a meta-analysis of more than many studies. They have a sensitivity uh, about 73%. The complication rate is negligible between 0 to 7.4. None of the patients have significant bleeding. The pneumothorax was 1%. Only 0.4% that necessitated intercostal tube application. No deaths were reported, so it is a very safe procedure. This is another in, in area where, uh, where there is high community of TB, uh, tuberculosis setting. We can reach, even with the EBIS uh, radial probe sensitivity, 77%. So uh, this is well. Uh, this is a good uh, uh, diagnostic yield. Also, this is uh, as uh, Professor Beckel said that you can do through agitation with a suction, not with the forceps. You can reach with a guided suction catheter. You can reach a good diagnostic yield, and it is complementary to the forceps biopsy. This is another example when you are confronted with peripheral lung uh, cavities. Even the EBIS probe can, can, can get this cavities and you can get diagnosis and it is even safe and effective even in peripheral lung lesions. Also, when it is compared using a prototype of thin bronchoscopy versus a guided cheese, it, present, it presented the same results, but when you use the thin bronchoscope with the probe, which is 1.4 millimeter ultrasound probe, it can reach a shorter time of the procedure, so you can make more rapid with the thin bronchoscope. Also, uh, another technique called uh, tumor senses, which is tomography, uh, senses a, a special t technique in the CT when you are confronted with ground glass opacification and you're highly suspicious that this may be an early bronchogenic carcinoma. So we can do also in these lesions, you can reach it with even a ground glass opacification. You can adjust, you can reach this with the endobronchial ultrasound and have good diagnostic yield in these lesions as well. Also, uh, uh, when you guide the, the cryoprobe, which is nowadays is used too much in peripheral lesions. You can guide the EBUS and it, is a, it, it have produced a good histological samples and large sample tissue were obtained when it was guided by the radial probe ultrasound. Even the uh, American College of Chest Physicians on their evidence-based guidelines, they recommend that in peripheral lung knee, uh, lesions, uh, the, you can put radial probe EBUS uh, to increase your diagnostic yield over the other conventional uh, methods. Also, uh, the important to combine the EBUS radial probe with other uh, guidance technique, for example, the virtual bronchoscopy. When you, when you combine it with the virtual bronchoscopy, you reach a diagnostic yield 63%, and it's much more uh, reaching 91% if you are in lesion between 2 uh, to 3 um, uh, centimeters, and less when you have less than 2 centimeters, 40%. Also, when you compound the EBIS with electromagnetic navigation, this is very interesting. When with EBIS 69%, with electromagnetic navigation 59%, when you combine both of them, this is 88%. So by combining the radial probe EBIS with the electromagnetic navigation, you can reach a diagnostic yield comparable and even reaching the CT guided, which is 92%, or even the surgical uh, biopsies, which is 100%. 
And this, uh, this is an example of a case which have a tumor in the left upper loop and the EBIS probe and the, uh, and the navigation through the electromagnetic navigation. And this patient can reach uh, brachytherapy even guided by the EBIS and the electromagnetic navigation. So you diagnose the case and, and even in some times when it is inoperable, you can do also uh, therapeutic uh, modality. So a meta-analysis of, uh, of all guided bronchoscopic the radial probe EBIS stands uh, comparable with all the other techniques, with whether virtual bronchoscopy, electromagnetic uh, navigation, guided cheese, ultra thin bronchoscopy, reaching a diagnostic uh, yield about 71% in peripheral lung lesions. I want to conclude my, study, my uh, talk about uh, a radial probe EBIS that we can guide it in peripheral lung lesions. It provides a real time ultrasound confirmation of the target localization prior to the biopsy. Using the radial probe EBIS, the vast majority of the peripheral lesions can be identified, even if the lesion is not visible by the fluoroscopy. You avoid radiation exposure. You have many ancillary uh, tools, including guided cheese, forceps, brush, double hinged curette, and guided suction catheter biopsy. By radial probe EBIS uh, position within the tumor, you can reach more diagnostic yield than it is adjacent to the tumor. The uh, diagnostic yield with the radial probe EBIS reaching between 70 to 73 percent. There is negligible complications, and there is no mortality recorded in all procedure. The combination of several guidance techniques improve the diagnostic yield to closer to the sensitivity achieved by CT-guided or surgical biopsies. Thank you very much. Uh, many thanks to Dr. Uh, Ashraf Matkor for uh, his illustrated uh, demonstration about uh, radial uh, EPAS. يعني ما فيش ان انا اتقدم بخالص شكري للجمعية البرونكولوجي على رأسهم استاذ دكتور اشرف حاتم دكتور طارق صفوت استاذي العزيز وباقي المشاركين والمساهمين في المؤتمر ان شاء الله النكست سبيكر اخويا العزيز الاستاذ دكتور احمد الحلفاوي هيتكلم على التانلينج ذا ليجن وانا كل ما بلاقي الدكتور احمد بغير منه وبقعد اجري وراه لانه ما بيخليناش حاجه جراحيه نعملها يعني اشكرك يا دكتور استاذ دكتور ياسر واشكر التشير بيرسونز انا النهارده هتكلم على نيو تكنيك في ال bronchoscopic technique for reaching the uh, peripheral lung lesions. All the techniques that we've discussed before um, depend on reaching the, to the tumor through the bronchi. But, so it needs a, a, a bronchus sign, meaning that the, the tumor has to be in direct contact with the, with the bronchus. Uh, but what if the tumor is outside the bronchi? It's within the lung parenchyma. This is what we will see today. Um, I just want to take you back f for some time and I will show you uh, how 50 years ago uh, physicians managed these conditions too. So bronchoscopy is a valuable tool for the diagnosis of central um, bronchogenic carcinomas. Um, um, but lesions beyond the central airways, the peripheral, um, they represent a challenge to the bronchoscopist various techniques uh, whole bell cytology transbronchial lung biopsies the fluoroscopy guidance ultrasound guidance electromagnetic navigations and also transthoracic techniques under ct guidance or ct or ultrasound guidance so 50 years ago this paper was published in cancer journal transbronchial biopsy smear for diagnosis of peripheral pulmonary carcinomas and they uh, report of a uh, uh, a technique that, have been, that they've been using since 1953, so before the, even the flexible bronchoscopy. They used um, uh, Metras bronchial casters, the bronchial casters designed with different angles uh, that they used for various um, um, reasons. One of them is to do bronchography, the others other to drain uh, abscesses. So, uh, it seems that these casters were familiar at that time. They are radio opaque. You can see them on the fluoroscopy. And they designed a specially, specially designed uh, curette, flexible curette that they in, could introduce through the metras needle. So uh, this x-ray, they, they, 
it's a very bad quality, 50 years ago, and application. So, but there is a, a soft tissue lesion in the right upper lobe here. They go on and do a bronchography. They look for a amputated bronchus or the bronchus that is occluded. So they know that this was the, 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 the site of the lesion. And they waited four days or three, four, three to four days until the, the bronchography material washed away. And then they performed the procedures that, that we're talking about. They introduced the metras catheter through the mouth not through a bronchoscope and the local anesthesia. And they manipulate the catheter until they reach the position that they wanted. They ask the patient to bite on the catheter and then they introduce the curette through, the, through the, um, uh, the, the catheter. They flex it and take um, uh, samples from the, from the lesion. And this is how they did it. So the patient is lying, he's awake on under local anesthesia and they applied the the catheter through the through the mouth different lesions they 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 tackled and they said that when the lesions were small so less than 2 cm there 15% of cases they could reach the, the, the lesion, two to three centimeters, up to 20%. But if lesions were more than three centimeters, they had 50% uh, chance of, of hitting the lesion and obtaining a biopsy. Um, but all, all of these, all of these um, uh, techniques depend on reaching the lesion through the bronchial wall. And uh, the, um, our colleague Ahmed, but he had an um, um, emergency situation. Uh, he was supposed to discuss the electromagnetic navigation, which is a, a, a form of, of computerized uh, virtual bronchoscopy that would guide the bronchoscope and the biopsy forceps inside the bronchi to reach the peripheral lesions. But now, what if the lesion is not in, in direct um, uh, contact with the bronchus, it's in here. So all the, all the techniques that depend on the bronchoscopic guidance will not be uh, uh, effective. So what I'm talking about today is a new concept technology. It's still not uh, applied. The, the, the study that I'm going to discuss is a, a canine model study, but we've seen in the last ACCP um, a couple of patients, they, the, the authors, uh, they showed the movies of how they did this with patients. And uh, the system is the Archimedes Total Lung Access Platform. Um, basically, it's a very complex uh, machine that has like a virtual bronchoscopy uh, with fluoroscopy, so it um, uh, integrates pictures from the bronchoscope with um, um, virtual image of the endobronchial with fluoroscopy and then I'll show you how, how they manage to reach a lesion. So it's an image guidance for bronchoscopy and fused fluoroscopy. It provides real-time navigation within the lungs for lung biopsy and other diagnostic and therapeutic procedures. Side-by-side -side navigation pairs real-time and virtual images throughout the procedure. They call the technique the transparenchymal nodule access. So the transparenchymal nodule access software algorithm automatically generates point of entry. The, the, like we see here, you get a, a, a green mark which shows this is the perfect uh, um, uh, site to penetrate the, the bronchial wall to reach the, the, the nodule. Um, so it generates a point of entry recommendation, register CT and real-time fluoroscopic images and overlay guidance onto live bronchoscopic and fluoroscopic video access. So I have all the technologies in one device. The software prescribes and guides a vessel-free, so uh, a nodule that is in the lung parenchyma is surrounded by blood vessels and the software will detect the blood vessels and it will um, um, demonstrate or, or um, suggest a track that is vessel-free and the shortest straight 
path to the nodule from the, uh, from the, bronchi from the bronchi. Uh, the authors also suggest that the, the, this prospect is not only reaching the legion, but also maybe applying a therapeutic uh, procedure towards this lesion, and so to get rid of the lesion, to diagnose maybe by rose and get rid of the lesion in the same setting. But this is all concept uh, theory. You get a, uh, a 3D um, uh, image of the of the of the lesion, and then you get on the screen the live the live um, um, white live bronchoscopy and the picture here shows you the, the best point of entry to reach the, 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 the lesion with all the blood vessels in the surrounding area are apparent. And what do you do when you get this point of entry? Well, you get to the, through the bronchoscope, introduce a sheath and through the sheath you put a needle to puncture the airway wall and then, through this sheath, you, you pass a, a, a balloon dilator that goes through the puncture, dilates up to four millimeter, dilates the bronchial um, opening in the bronchial wall up to four millimeters. And then you advance a, a probe that is stiff, but blunt at the end, through the opening, and advance guided by fluoroscopy towards the needle. And when you hit the needle, uh, when you hit the target, you, you reach the target area, you remove the, the probe and insert uh, uh, biopsy forceps and take the biopsies from the legion. Um, the publication that came out about this technology was in uh, dealing with canine models. Um, so the authors, uh, they produced um, a, a model for peripheral lung nodules in nine dogs they injected filler material used in cosmetic surgery, which is a bit uh, sticky and can be identified and, and on biopsies. They can be stained and be um, uh, identified on, uh, on hematoxyl and eosine stain. So in nine dogs, they did 31 peripheral lung lesions. Um, uh, and they performed this technique and got biopsies from the, from the, from the lung lesions. They were very small, um, but still they could reach these uh, lesions. And, and in 31 lesions, they performed 31 tunnels. The average length of the tunnel was 35 millimeters, varying from 20 to 50 millimeters, so up to five centimeters. You can go through the lung parenchyma and they reached up to eight millimeters from the pleura. Uh, the average diameter of the lesions was 9.5 millimeters, very small, and the diagnostic yield of, the, uh, of this technique was 90%. No major complications. They found no major complications. They had fluoroscopy, so could, they could check for pneumothoraces at the same time. No pneumothoraces were produced. No major bleeding. They recorded that the the maximum amount of bleeding was two milliliters of blood that came out of the, after the, the procedure. And, his, and this is uh, uh, the, the X-ray with overlaid with the 31 uh, lesions that they produced by the filler, and the green ones are the ones that they could uh, diagnose with this technique, and the red ones are the ones that they did not reach. And so they conclude that this was a pilot study in canine model with very small number of animals and tunnels. Maybe the larger, uh, larger number of animals or models or subjects, maybe then the, the results would be lower. But the low rate of complication is very uh, um, um, encouraging. There's no, no pneumothoraces and no bleeding. Um, they get got larger biopsy size than the transparent trans thoracic needle uh, aspiration and biopsies, so better diagnosis, and the possibility of applying um, uh, or a treatment modality for, the, for these uh, peripheral lung nodules through the same technique is also very hopeful. And thank you very much. Thank you, Ahmed, for uh, this.
very nice presentation about tunneling and drilling into the lung. I think it needs a, a lot of discussion, but we'll, uh, we'll make this discussion during the coffee break because we, we all need two strong coffees now. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank all the speakers uh, of this session, and I think we can convene for, uh, we have a break for 15 minutes and be back at maximum one o'clock because we have very nice sessions after that. Thank you very much, and I'd like to thank uh, Yasser and Ala for co-sharing with me. Thank you very much.